Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where you meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gottberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast lovers. This is the 47th episode of the Shipping Podcast. You will be meeting Johan Melkvist. He is a professor of Earth and Space Science, and he specializes in optical remote sensing at Chalmers University of Technology here in Gothenburg. You probably wonder why should we listen to a professor of Earth and Space Science? Well, when I met Anna Larsson, which you can listen to in the 39th episode, we spoke about the Trident Alliance. And that is the ship owners that are complying with the new regulations who thinks that enforcements of those regulations are important. We spoke about what happens if you don't comply, etc. Anna told me that there are not a lot of tools to measure if the ship owners are complying or not, but I have found one. Johan Melkvist has found a way to measure if the ships are complying with the sulfur rules or not. He has been working for a long time with the car industry, so he knows what he is talking about. Just wait and see. I have a sponsor for this episode. It's Alandia Marine, an insurance company servicing the needs of the shipping community that has realized that this is a way to support the shipping podcast and also to advertise to people in the shipping industry. Alandia Marine is a stable and reliable partner who delivers comprehensive insurance solutions adapted to their clients' individual needs and are focusing on long-term relationships. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Thank you. Could you please introduce yourself? I'm Johan Melquist and I'm a professor in optical remote sensing at Chalmers University in Göteborg. Sweden. What is optical remote sensor? So we, uh, I'm a specialist in developing tools for different uh, environmental applications of, of measuring. And uh, one of the things that we are, are doing is, is that we're developing tools to, to monitor ship emissions. And that's probably why we are sitting here. Yeah. So what is your background? I uh, have a degree in engineering physics here at Chalmers. Uh, master in that, and then I did a PhD in physics uh, also here. I've also been working for a part time in, in um, at something called Swedish Environmental Research Institute (IVL) with uh, environmental work in general. Always environmental work. Yes. And how did you come into shipping? I came into shipping because there was a need to develop uh, surveillance tools to see whether the ships were obeying international rules. And so we picked up that need and started to apply for projects and so on. And, and we were successful in getting them. So there was no need before the regulations came into force? or uh, Maybe there was a need. Uh, yeah, there was definitely a need, but that sort of uh, was a driver. Because in, in my line of work, you, you, you need some funding. It's, uh, we need to develop and buy instruments and, and, and have PhD students and, and all that is costly. So... So you need to have some, some funding to do it on, in, properly. Is it the same done in other kind of transport modes? I mean, air and flights and things like that? Or is it you are specializing in shipping? But Well, personally, I've also been involved in, in, uh, in transport in, in car emissions. We've done remote sensing across the road of, of cars. And this is sort of a spin-off from that type of work that I did 10 years before I started with shipping. So we're 10 years behind in shipping yeah, compared right. to the cars. Yeah. So how does it work? Can you describe it? Can I understand it? Uh, yes. Um, so the, the, the main objective, what I've been working with, is to be able to see, to measure whether a ship that is passing in a ship route, a ship that is passing you, whether that is, is using a, a good fuel or bad fuel. And a good fuel means low sulfur in the fuel, because there's a regulation that, that has been that is in effect right now. 
So from remotely, from far away, without stepping aboard the ships, the idea is that we should be able to investigate and have a tool which can tell whether the ships are using good or bad fuel. Okay, so how is that done? And how is that done? Well, either we we do we, we have different types of, of the measurements. We have one airborne, so we fly in an airplane. And that's that's where we started. From an airplane, this is where you can find most ships on the seas. You can you can really understand what they're doing out there because they don't know you're coming. And from and what we do is that um, we have an optical device that uses the, the sun that is scattered on the on the waves, and from the solar light you can actually see sulfur, um, nitrous oxide, some other stuff. So just just by looking down in the smoke when you pass the, 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 the ship from that from an airplane, you can actually determine that this is a ship that seems to be using low or high sulfur fuel. So that technique is, is a good technique because you don't have to be so low, fly to so low. You can fly a couple of hundred meters, maybe three, four, five hundred meters height. And you can easily pick it up if there seems to be a suspect ship that is using high sulfur fuel or, or, low, or low sulfur. Then we have a second technique on the aircraft. We have what we call the sniffer technique. So it's actually instruments that suck in the air through the tubings. And then you analyze the, the concentrations. And instantly or? Instantly, yes. And what we do is actually we measure the ratio of sulfur and carbon in the smoke stadia. So the ratio of sulfur and carbon. Sulfur comes from the sulfur fuel. Carbon comes from carbon in the fuel. So the ratio of sulfur and carbon is directly proportional to the sulfur fuel content. So, so just by doing that, you can directly say, you can directly measure what's the sulfur fuel content that is being used by the ship. The disadvantage with that method is that you have to fly low. You have to fly down in the smoke, so it's more and more exciting flying, I'd say. So you fly sort of a zigzag pattern in the smoke of the ship, and sometimes you have to go down to 200 feet or 65 meters. It's quite okay, but it's, it's still... It's still a more stressy situation at 65 meters because you're almost at chimney height. And of course, if there's an engine failure or something, then uh, you don't have too much time to react. So you do, it's not preferable to stay at that, at that altitude. You're looking forward to the drones. Yeah, I mean, uh, but the, the drones, they cannot carry our equipment, unfortunately, right oh. now. Well, the, maybe the bigger guys, they're the really big drones. But uh, So how heavy is the... The optical equipment is it's not super heavy, but it's, right, right now it's about uh, 20, 30 kilos, uh, while the other have, is maybe 100 kilos. Or, well, actually, it's 60 kilos is the, is the sniffer, and maybe 20 kilos is the, is the kernel in the optical thing. A drone typically carries 5 kilos or something, the small drones. Then the bigger go- the drones can carry much more, but then they are, you don't want to fly them too low, I think, and there's a lot of restrictions and so on. So um, we have stayed with the aircraft um, surveillance. There are other projects going around with the same objective as we have, but they are using a new type of a sensor technique. It's electrochemical sensor and, and semiconductors. In my mind, it's questionable how well they work. They don't work too well, actually. But uh, so there's a... Um, you have to stay in the smoke for one minute, and that's not easy if you fly... It's a lot of questions about quality and so on. So, and if you start to do monitoring uh, or survey ships, you don't want to have a lot of false, you know, de- determination saying that this guy seems to be using high sulfur and this guy, you know. And when they when it's investigated further, you they find out there's no correlation between what you measure and what's what's the reality. So we have tried to go from state of the art everything, try to do as best as we can try to make this type of monitoring acceptable for everyone and work a lot of, with quality to avoid this type of false things. Because if you get into that situation that you have a technique that falsely points out ships, your technique can be miscredited and suddenly there is no respect, there is no one. It can take maybe 10 years before you can start again. You know, Everyone will say, oh, you can trust that. We have to do something else. Mm. So on. So. When you are in, in the airplane... Uh, you have to know which ship to measure, or can you see that from from above to see? Wow, 
this looks a bit suspicious or I mean, no, 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 no. I mean, you, you can't see the sulfur. I mean, you can you can see it's black smoke in from ship, but that's not the same thing as sulfur. Black smoke that's the same as particles. That's the same as soot. So that's another. Uh, that's an engine that is not working properly. Well, they could do it. Well, maybe old, or they should do something, but doesn't have to do with the sulfur that we are trying to check. We are doing that as well. We are doing a lot of other environmental type of measurements as well to obtain information what's the real emissions going out and see what's what is the shipping sector contributing to when it comes to particles and NOx and other stuff but again that has not been the main driver for our work our main driver has been compliance monitoring and right now it's sulfur and it's NOx nitrogen oxides that uh, well, they they are in effect in the United States, but not here. Uh, not right now. So coming back to your question about how can we see the ships and so on. Um, the, because the, all ships, they have something called AIS. It's a transponder to, that sends out what is the name of the ship and what is the, its position, where is it going, etc., etc. And it's very easy to, to have a AIS responders and something that listens to the AIS signal. And, and we have that built in in our system. So we just listen to the ship traffic and we can make a map of all ships that is in the, in the area. And we know where they're going and we can calculate where the smoke is coming, which direction it goes out from the ship based on, on, the, on the wind as well. So then we basically fly into the smoke and our program is so smart right now. So we have a program that takes into account the measurements, the gas measurements. It takes into account the AIS signal, and wind information and so on. So it, it by itself, it can actually, it says that, okay, now we just pay, pass Stenodonica. It was clean, it's fine. It has 0.1% sulfur fuel and this amount of NOx. So, so wow. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been working on this? Well, I think I started 2002 with some test experiments, but in 2006, so for almost 10 years, we were sort of, I mean, in a more focused way, several people and, and, and focused towards it, doing tests and flights and, uh, and so on. And then you got one fixed box in the port. Yes, as a spin-off to this airborne work that we did. That, um, that was like the main thing that we were supposed to do in the project that I was working on. We realized, okay, why don't we, since we have a system that is, you know, working automatically basically that can determine ships on its own and so on uh, let's put one station in a, in a ship channel uh, on the ground to see how well that works so we put one uh, already in 2008 2009 we put one at, at the inlet channel of Göteborg it's, it's uh, an island called Elsborgs Ørn uh, it's, it's an old fortress that used, was, that used to belong to the Danish people. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they, it never... Yeah, they, they conquered it. They were on that island, I promise you. Oh, they were? I've read okay. that story. For 10 days they held it. For oh, for days. 10 days, okay, yeah. There's this gunball, cannonballs yeah. into, into, the, into the wall, but I think they look glued. I think it's for tourists. <laughs> I'm not quite sure if Gothenburg was Gothenburg at that stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But most of the time I think it's been a Swedish fortress anyway. So basically, yeah, and the ships are passing really close. And what is needed, if you have a fixed station, it's actually based on the sniffer technique only. Right. Well, no, now we have both, but we our main technique there is the sniffer technique instead of having the optical measurement. So what is the sniffer? Sniffer, again, is, is that you measure the sulfur to coal ratio by you measuring the concentration. You, you suck in the gas into instruments that are... At the Ellsborg Island, we have a, we had the instruments in a yellow box. And uh, so it's, that's a good... Uh, um, people remember that yellow box. It's like a mailing box. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> is it the same size as a mailing box or is it? Yeah, more or less like a small fridge. Like a small fridge. Okay. Maybe so I'll... I have people coming from all over the place and they want to see this yellow box, you know. <laughs> so maybe I have to go there. Yeah, 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 you have to do that. Yes. <laughs> you can get it, a picture it, of it. Okay. <laughs> It isn't guarded in any way, so I can just walk up. Yeah, and take no, it it's actually to be honest, it's uh, it's actually inside. It's it's just inside the piece roof. So on the fortresses, they used to build roofs on the walls made of out of wood. During wartime, it has to be kicked down because then they had, they put their guns there. But uh, right now there's a piece roof, so so we are just we have it just inside as, a, as an extra shelter. So so uh, it's not, uh, but it can be outside. It's made to be outside. 
It could become a tourist uh, thing. Yeah, it could yeah. be. Yeah. You could have a guided tour of that. Yeah. So, but it it will actually be. We will switch that. So, so the yellow box we plan now to put at the Urson Bridge instead, and we will have another box. Out but there. you will keep to the yellow color. Yeah, if we can, yes. <laughs> So anyway, this system that we are using there, it automatically just sucks in the air, analyzes the sulfur and carbon ratio of the air. You know. And when it sees that there's extra high concentrations of sulfur or carbon dioxide or some, some or NOx or something, it uh, says, oh, okay, there must be a ship here now. Okay, let's look in the AIS information. It, it looks in the AIS information and it realizes, okay, just now upwind there was a ship that was uh, passing. Uh, with a certain IMO number, etc., etc. So then it calculates the ratio in this uh, little extra uh, plume. It, it only there's only high gas there for maybe 20, 30 seconds. The, like the smoke plume passes, you know. So it's like a little mountain in the data. It goes up and it goes down. You know. So it looks at that uh, that time period and it looks at the ratio of the of the sulfur, which is SO2, and the carbon, which is carbon dioxide. So it, that it's measuring. So it, it can measure that ratio. And it calculates it, and it multiplies by 0.232, and it, then it gets something that says sulfur fuel content. So buff, it gets 0.15% from this ship with this IMO number, etc. Et and then what it does, it sends the data, it determines was this a good or bad measurement. It can do that uh, depending on how strong the signal was, depending on wind direction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if it was a good measurement, it sends the data into a database that we have here at Chalmers. That is a, it's a public data. So I have a database with many, many thousands of, of measurements. So did you see a change then by 1st of January 2015? Yeah, we saw a huge change. That it, or, it did was that a, come before? Or did it, that uh, it, was, it was a little gradual change, especially from the, some of the shipping uh, companies like Stena and so on, they were, uh, you could see that they were experimenting during summer, that there were some periods were very low and it went up again. And then gradually some of the ships were, they started to decrease already in November, December. I guess they were emptying the, some of the stuff they had. And, and But uh, by January 1st, it was actually really good. It was really good. We also realized that, I mean, this was the first time that one could actually measure this, but only had a situation where there was only low ships basically. So then we realized that, that we had some troubles with our, in our instruments, that we have, done, we have done some things for the airborne to make, make them quick, but they became a little sensitive to particles. So ships that uh, have, because of lubricant oil, you get particles from that. So ships that were emitting a lot of those particles, our the sulfur instrument did have, had a false response to that a little. So it took a little while for us to understand. So we got some false signals, not that they were super high, but that they were above this 0.1%. So, so we, have, we have now worked on the data. So to say, what is the uncertainty of the data with that effect? Now we have removed that effect by it. We have added some extra things uh, now when we realize that we, so we have done some things now. So, so now we don't have that effect anymore. But during... The first period, 2015, we had it. So we went out even with a press release and was saying that we could see that 80% of the ships were clean. They were below the 0.1, but we still had, I don't know if it was the 80, but typically 80 or 90%. So, so the rest, 10, 15%, they were sort of, uh, well, they were mostly caused by this lubricant oil stuff, you know. So, so, um, so but, you have seen a change now. I mean, now we're in 2016, so now... It's still low. It's still very, very low. There's just a few exceptions, but I mean, it's like 98% or something that we see are... are um, yeah. Again, we don't have... Um, the threshold is 0.1%. That's what you have to have, you know. And because we are doing this far away measurement, we have some uncertainties in our measurements that, you, that are higher than if you went into the oil and took a sample went away. So what we have to do is we have to determine what is the uncertainty of our measurement. What is so we cannot see I cannot see the difference between a ship that is 0.1 and rather and a ship that is 0.12. You know. Uh, while the onboard sampling, when you take sample, they have that precision. So like when the Swedish uh, transport uh, agency when they take a sample 
They do about 200 samples per year, I think. The precision or the accuracy of their measurement is, is in the order of like, that they can see the difference between 0.1 and 0.12. So they think it's significant if a ship is 0.13, for instance, they will say, ah, oh, it is high, or 0.15, it's high. It has to be under 0.1 within the uncertainty. If I have a ship that is 0.13, I'll say that, okay, it's still within the noise of my measurements. So I have like, I have to go to 0.3 in order to say, if someone is above 0.3, then I will say it's definitely high. But again, the limit is, if they really cheat, they would use 1% to 1.5 or 2%. So we are pushing that limit now, uh, but it takes a little, it takes some time to, you know, to do this, to do this job properly. I get some, some thoughts in my head. How many measurements do you do? Per year, if they do 200 with the sample. Well, well we I think we did 4,000 or something yeah. uh, last year. Because that's mm. the number of ships calling. Yeah, I mean, we, the, we can only see the ships that are... It, the, the wind has to be in the right direction. Uh-huh. Because we only have one system. We could we could put up several systems, but now it has to be a southerly component of the wind. So it can be southeast, southwest or south. But So you need a yellow box on the other side of the... Yeah, yeah if, we, if we did that, we can have a higher... You know, we can we can measure more ships. But we, I also have a station in Denmark at the Great Belt Bridge, and uh, we have twenty five thousand ships passing. So, so we should be able to. I'm not sure how many we have measured right now, but we have. I think we have measured more than five thousand there the last six seven months. It, it started last summer. Do you ask to go there and say, and put up your yellow box, or are you asked to come? Please come with your yellow box. In Denmark, we are working for the for the Danish Environmental Protection Agency. So they have a project, a two-year pilot project, where we are doing airborne measurements around the coast of Denmark, and we are doing this monitoring from the from the Great Belt Bridge. So it's a client work. We don't even own the we don't even own the data. We can we can use the data for research, but there's some added value because we can do some other stuff as well. It's expensive. It is expensive to fly, and and and. Um, So we do that. Then we are part of an EU project. Uh, it's a CEF project, uh, and part is Motorways of the Seas, where several countries in Europe now is trying. It's, it's a pilot project again, trying to build up a, a European monitoring network for, for doing this type of surveillance. So it's Finland, it's, it's uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden, and uh, Denmark and Germany. They are associated to this also. So the, the, so the next step in my mind would be that yeah when you get that measurement with the ship that is 1% there is a signal to the coast guard and or there's a signal to the port state control authority which is the Swedish transport agency. Yeah, if we were in the United States it yeah. would be the US coast guard. In the United States it's actually the EPA the Environmental Protection Agency who have the role of of surveillance surveillance role. But they wouldn't do anything practical themselves. It's the US Coast Guard who does actually the port state control. But they don't have, I think they're doing it sort of on a contract for the EPA in the United States. Um, so we have also been actually, I did a project in uh, in LA now in, uh, in in October, November. We were doing Long Beach Harbor and, and LA Harbor, driving around a ship, a small ship checking the ships that were coming in and out of the harbor and we also had a, st- a station there but that was a part of it it was actually, actually air quality work to see what are the what's happening in the port and, and so on but we were able to just demonstrate this compliance monitoring we found some sh- some ships that were high for instance that was really high so we have we are now having a discussion with the EPA to put this uh, put some boxes uh, for instance at the, in Long Beach harbor uh, also up in San Francisco So your yellow boxes will conquer the world. I hope will. so. <laughs> <laughs> so. So what can it not measure? I mean, it can't be the solution to every uh, regulation we've got now. I mean, we have more regulations coming up. This is made for sulfur. It's for sulfur regulation. There's another regulation which is, has to do with NOx. It's a little more complicated, the NOx regulation, because it, it applies to ships that are built 2016. So it will take uh, so it will take a couple of years before that comes new build ships that uh, you can measure it. Oh, so in five years from now maybe there will be a, you know I don't I'm not sure how how fast uh, the fleet is replacing itself. So it, uh, 
I guess they, I guess the ship lasts for 25, 30 years or so. So that means in five years, 20% of the ships will, be, will have been built 2016. So then the NOx comes even more interesting to work on. And how do you see, I mean, we got 2020 as a new limit when all the seas are going to be... Yeah, that's or, right. That's right. So the, then the, I think that, well, coming back to our results. So basically our results last year, during 2015, they show that uh, ships in the in the Seca region, which is called here in, in Scandinavia, they they obeyed really well. To uh, they followed, they complied with the the new regulation, and that's been a little that's that's almost a surprise for I guess for everyone, for most people, because it's been like there's been a lot of discussion that okay, one third of the ships uh, there's always been numbers, you know, they will not obey this, you know. And uh, all the Russian ships, they will, they will, they will not do anything, and etc., etc., etc. But I guess because the oil price it got so low, so right now the, the well, the good fuel now today costs approximately the same as the bad fuel two years ago, the one percent fuel and, and the point one percent. So the shipping sector, they so they they sort of kept the same fuel costs. Mm-hmm. But in the future now, we don't know what I mean. The oil price will not stay this low forever. Uh, and also in 2020, there will be a much more competition also again to, to get this low sulfur fuel uh, when everybody is supposed to use that. So it's that there will be a new situation again. So so I guess our yellow boxes should be something that should be really handy, I think, to be able to use 2020. But do you see an armada of airplanes all over the place at the same time measuring? You don't need to have an armada of airplanes because they can cover it. But I mean, maybe in Europe you need you need three or four airplane aircraft. You need a one or two in the Mediterranean Sea and in France, and, and then maybe one channel, one in the Channel, and one in the Baltic Sea, something like that. That's what I would guess. How do you see the future of shipping in general? I mean, we are now talking about the future from your perspective. Everyone I speak to says that uh, they have never seen so many regulations. And maybe it's time for us to have so many regulations, but there are more coming up and people are discussing everything. Uh, hopefully they won't discuss as long as they have done for the ballast water, no. which they've discussed for 15 years now. But I understand that the problem there is that the regulations are not as sharp or, or as they could be, because now the technique has sort of passed by the regulation. So if you're going to impose regulations on shipping, you need to be a bit more strict. And that is why it hasn't been ratified yet. That is what I understand. And that has also got to do with environmental things. The technique is developing so fast now. I think we are in an era of, you know, it's a paradigm shift. Everything is changing now. So what changes do you see in your area, your field of knowledge for the future? Well, I mean, I think it's the reason why I think the feeling is that things are changing quickly in the shipping sector because they they didn't do anything for 40 years or something or 50, I don't know how many years. Everybody knows that. In land, when it comes to all types of combustion, they've been working with... My whole working life, you know, I've been involved in measuring in flue gases and things like this. And there's been abatement techniques around and so on. So right now, it's why things are changing so quickly in shipping. It's because shipping has to catch up with the, with the reality of, of, of the world. And if shipping should become sustainable, if it's something that then it has to catch up with what, what, what are the requirements of, of uh, the developing world. Shipping relies on that people need goods from that there's a trade and, and goods and then of course that then there's a pressure from people in the end that the transport has to be clean. It should not sort of destroy the environment and, and, the, and the globe. So I think it's shipping's own fault that they they waited so long, so long, and they tried to prevent anything from happening. And now they have to catch up, and now they they have to move quicker than the rest of the society because they they didn't do anything. I think that's the character of shipping. Everyone waits until 5 to 12 yeah. and then and then it's in place 2 minutes past 12. Yeah. 
I think I live in an incubator, more or less, because mm. there are new things happening all the time, new developments, new ideas, which I haven't seen as many, as you say, for the last 40. I haven't been around for 40 years, <laughs> but I haven't seen that for a long time. No. With all this... Uh, Technical developments on, on uh, both on scrubber and alternative fuels. And mm. But I mean, on the other hand, it's uh, it's an also also a business opportunity for for a country like Sweden. I mean, we, that we are and or or the whole sector region now where we are required to use low sulfur fuel. It pushes innovation, and so it will give an advantage in the end. I think when the rest of the world have to follow. Well, of course, the whole thing with this now is that, that there's an equal playing field. That's why I think the shipping sector, the established one, they like what we are doing. They like what we are doing. They, they ask for that, that there should be some compliance monitoring so that everybody follows the same rules. And in my mind, 2015 has been a success. There's been an equal playing field. So I think that from my point of view, all these regulations really need to have a controls. You need to make sure that no one is cheating. And you need to measure that. You cannot, you cannot, you have to do that. And it's surprising that there was so little thinking of that. We are the only ones that we started really early or 15 years ago. We were the only ones doing this for years and years and years. Now we have people, we have started up a CEF project and so on, but it's people that are using our technique. We've been the first ones that have shown that this is possible to do it this way and, and so on. Yeah, but also if you are not in compliance, the rules for the different countries do not match each other. So there is no EU regulation on what happens if you are not in compliance. Mm -hmm. That is up to each and every yeah. nation. And they all act differently. Of course, because they got different laws, different mm -hmm. national laws. In France, I understand, you can actually sue your competitor because then they are not competing on the same grounds, mm. which you couldn't do in Sweden in that way. Yeah. So is someone looking at that point of view in your project? No. I mean, we are just a technical. We, are from, we, are, we don't do that, that part. But in Sweden, they, it's not even in place, the system. And that's a little embarrassing, I think, for the someone high up in the who is responsible it's actually it's it's the department of business or something they say they had so much to do with the syria crisis so they didn't have time to put this in place but it's been known for years and years that it was coming it should be in place already january 1st 2015 but one year after it's not in place and the only thing that that makes it better right now is that there are basically they don't find you don't really find too many ships that are non-compliant so it would be a nightmare if there was like if we found that one third of the ships were not complying and you had to and they had no they had no system yet how to to, to find them. yeah and some countries they have they are longer gone there yes and i think for instance united states they don't have a system for measurement they are, i mean we can we, sh we come and show them and they say oh this is fantastic this is just what we are looking for in the united states they say that and they are like number one in doing measurements usually, you know. But they haven't didn't think about that. So they only have a fine. They are strong on the if Yeah, because you don't discuss with US Coast Guard. No, exactly, exactly. So have you been in contact with the uh, Transport Canada? Yes, a little. Uh, because they are I mean they are ahead of us in a way. I met the head of Transport Canada last year. He was here to the Motorways of the Sea Conference and uh, he showed some figures of what they have been experiencing since they are a little bit ahead of the Seca area and that mm -hmm. was very interesting mm -hmm. okay yeah I've had them as visitors on my airplane we were out with someone from uh, Transport Canada but uh, okay. it's always been on more because they, they are also in charge of the Arctic yeah. and at the moment they are in the Arctic Council yeah they are trying to lay some rules for the Arctic areas and that applies to some other for instance black carbon you know particles and so on that's a very hot topic. So there's some other stuff that doesn't have to do with sulfur. If I were the prime minister, could I buy a yellow box from you? Yes, you could. How much will I pay for it? How much? Well, it, it depends on how much money you have. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's typically it's it's not a cheap system. It's um, some something like two hundred thousand euros, a little le a little less, because it, you need to have some uh, service and all that stuff, you know. Mm. Some commercial, so somewhere between, 
150 and 200,000 euros. Um, Do you get much interest from ports? I mean, other ports than Port of Gothenburg, have they approached you for this? Well, well, we have had one in Long Beach and they are very Sorry, interested but, there. Yeah. Yeah. But not and uh, we, and we, will talk, we are talking with China right now. They have decided to implement this type of rules now in China. So things are happening, for sure. So you have a great future ahead of you. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> After all that long and hard work you've yeah. done, put in. It's interesting. It's so interesting. Shipping is often looked upon as an invisible industry. What do you think we could do to become more known to the general public? I'm not from the shipping sector, so that's my, this is my personal opinion. So it's not a professional opinion. So, I mean, since we are living in Göteborg, shipping is not invisible, obviously. We see shipping every day in, in Göteborg. But, but I think that from my perspective, what I work with, the most important stuff is that you should prevent the black smoke People associate shipping with air pollution. It's not difficult for people to understand if I say that the shipping is that they produce air pollution, everybody will, will nod their head and say, yes, that's the case. They've seen the black smoke themselves. You know, you hear all these horror stories. It adds to this, this story. So I think, I think the shipping sector, the first thing they should do, and they, they work on that right now, is to wash away their air pollution. They, they should really show that they take responsibility to do as much as they ever can to make this sustainable. Because it's the obvious way of transporting goods, you know, and we will have oceans for inevitable times, you know, in the future. But they should not pour things into water and they should not pour things into air. So I think that's one thing. And then, of course, there's a lot of cool things now happening with hybrid ferries and a lot, a lot of technique and you know that they can promote as well so I, that it's not an old steam technology future there's new types of ships that can do new types of things it's interesting because 20 years ago i think everyone said we have to prevent um, oil spill into mm. the water because everyone knows shipping for oil spill yeah. and now you say everyone knows shipping is for pollution to air it's interesting when yeah. we have moved from 20 years ago Because nowadays it's so minimal oil spill. There is yeah. almost none unless there is a big accident. Yeah. So things are improving. I can understand that from your way of reasoning. Yeah, absolutely they are improving. But I think that you have to be almost better than... I mean, I've been working now for almost 30 years or something, 25. And when I started to work with the environment and so on, the industrial sector in Sweden... They were this traditional way of saying, ah, oh, we don't pollute anything and we don't have, you know, but they were polluting. It was obvious, you know, the, the forest industry and everything, had, there was impact everywhere. But they, it improved a lot. Now they are even in the forefront. They do things they know from a public relation. It's important for them. Someone who pollutes is not good for you when it comes to business. I think it's the same with the shipping now. For them, they should be even better than they, than they have to be. And there are, I know there are attempts like that. They realize that they have to be better than the rules because there will be new rules coming all the time. So, so they should be ahead of the game and stop complaining about everything is so expensive and, uh, and there will be a shifting, a mold, mold shift to trucks instead and so on. They, I, they should not complain about this. I mean, they've had advantages for so many years. So if they cannot comply with, uh, if they cannot follow a modern society, then it's not, it's not sustainable, and then it will die, basically. But it doesn't have to be that way, and, it, and, and they, are not, they are working hard not to do so. I think it's a good future. Who do you think I should meet the next time? Who would you want to listen to in a podcast interview? Maybe you should, you should talk to, to the people who are up in the government in Sweden okay. as, as high as possible and ask them why there's no, there is no system in place yet for... What if, you, if you talk about sulfur, the sulfurals, I would like to hear what they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the regulations are there for a reason. And the reason is for us to have a better environment. Mm. The people on land. Yeah. The inhabitants of Sweden who are living here or in the other countries. Thank you, Joa. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time. Thank you. And uh, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I met Johan Melkvist on the 29th of March 2016. I was relieved to hear that so many of the ships in the Seca area is complying and that Johan has been able to determine that and to show that.
I hope that Yuan succeeds in showing that in other parts of the world as well. Last week, I made a deep dive into the statistics of the shipping podcast. This podcast is now downloaded in more than 133 countries, and I can see that it's mostly where the maritime activity is taking place. 3,500 people download this shipping podcast every month. I know it's not a lot compared to the big shows, but it goes to show that I have found a niche and a need. You can help me make a difference with this podcast. We need more people to download the shipping podcast for it to hit the top list so that people can just stumble upon it and start listening to maritime professionals sharing their everyday job and their passion for this industry. You can share episodes in your own social channels, either from the website shippingpodcast.com or from Facebook. Your friends maybe need to know that there are other people like you who has got the shipping bug. Or maybe you can inspire the next generation to actually be a bit curious about the maritime community. So, until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast where the maritime professionals are talking about their everyday jobs.